Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Alyssa Ferron, and I am the director and curator here at Dunlop Art Gallery. Uh, Hello, I'm joining everyone. you. Welcome. My name is Alyssa Ferron. I am the director and curator here at Dunlop Art Gallery. Uh, Hello, I'm joining you. Welcome. My name is Elizabeth. I am the director and curator here at Dunlop Art Gallery. So, I just want to, let's restart. Okay, let's try this again. Sorry about that. Okay, this is better. Hi, everyone. Sorry about the technical difficulties, but we're back. Okay, um, let's try this again. Sorry about that. Okay. okay this is better. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Mira. Um, my name is Alyssa Ferron, and I'm the director and curator here at Dunlop Art Gallery in Regina, Saskatchewan. I'm joining you from Treaty 4 territory. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to do the land acknowledgement. Um, we are here, well, specifically, I am joining you from Treaty 4 because we're all joining you from different, different places. Um, so Treaty 4, I'd like to acknowledge is the traditional lands of the Cree, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis. Um, and so today I really have the honor to introduce you to our two special guests who are going to be discussing um, the artist talk titled Fashioning the Diaspora. And so we're joined by Mira Seti, who I had the opportunity to read to meet recently here in Regina on the occasion of the opening reception for her exhibition, Ritual Intimacies, which is on now at Dunlop Art Gallery. Um, and if you haven't checked it out yet, I highly recommend that you see it. Uh, tomorrow's the last day. And the exhibition, as I mentioned, is on now at Dunlop's Sherwood Village uh, Gallery location. And then we're also joined by Mriga, um, Kapadia. So Mriga, I haven't yet had the opportunity to meet you in person, um, but I, I've definitely been a fangirl of Nor Black, Nor White for a long time. And I've, I've watched the trajectory of the label and just really admired the success um, uh, for, for quite some time. So I'm really honored to have you uh, joining us for this discussion today with Mira. Um, so I'm going to start by reading the artist's bio for Mriga, and then I'll read the bio for Mira. So Mriga Kapadia uh, was raised in Toronto and is one of the co-founders of Nor Black, Nor White, along with Amrit Kumar. Um, and so along with Amrit, Mriga moved to India in 2009 to explore their Indian roots. Traveling across the country, they were exposed to the many disappearing art forms and artisan communities. And Nor Black Nor White was born out of a desire to reinterpret these ancient practices of textile design while bringing together their worlds by mashing up their love for Michael Jackson, 90s R&B, and all things old and gold. Um, and... Uh, I'm going to read the, the bio now for uh, Mira Saiti, who is, as I mentioned, the uh, current exhibiting artist at uh, Dunlop Art Gallery. And I should mention, by the way, that that exhibition, Ritual Intimacies, was um, guest curated by Noor Bangu, 
who is a Norway and Winnipeg based uh, scholar and curator. So Mira Saiti is a contemporary Canadian visual artist with an interdisciplinary intuitive and research-based practice that moves between painting, drawing, fiber, photography, illustration, performance, and social practice. Through her work, she delves deep into the ways we understand and appreciate cloth, clothing, and the worn body, including its histories, its resonances, and its possibilities. So just to give you all at home who are watching a sense of the framework for tonight's discussion, um, we'll begin by Mira and Riga sort of just having an informal conversation, which will last roughly around 45 minutes or so. And then after that conversation, we'll leave time towards the end for about a 10 minute Q&A. So if you have questions or comments that you'd like to ask or share with the artist, um, I would encourage you to drop those questions in, in the chat. Uh, whether you're watching online on Facebook or YouTube or however you're accessing the, the video, uh, please write your questions and comments in the chat. And so I also want to share a reminder to everyone to please be kind and welcoming and gracious in your comments and questions. This is a virtual space. Nonetheless, it's still a space where we encourage everyone um, to participate in a good way, and we we know that everyone is welcome. So, without further ado, um, and thank you again for your patience as we as we sort through some of the technical difficulties. There's always there's always something, and you know we're we're working across three different time zones. So, um, thank you for giving us grace as we sort through some of these these. Uh, yeah, just what it means to be living and working in a digital world. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to the artists who, um, yeah, thank you again for joining us. And we look forward to hearing about your practice. Mira, I think you need to, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> I think you guys can hear me now. Good. Um, I was just saying it's Mercury retrograde. So yeah, of course, it's, this is going to go down. Um, I wanted to just, uh, I missed all the introductions, but I did want to thank, uh, say a few thank yous to uh, Alyssa Farron, the director of the Dunlop Gallery, um, for initiating this conversation and suggesting it. Um, and uh, sort of pointing out, I did an artist talk there uh, a couple months ago, and um, Alyssa pointed out uh, a number of parallels between um, the work that uh, Nor Black Nor White has done and some of my imagery and some of the issues that I think about. So thank you for that. Uh, also, thank you to Wendy and the staff for making this happen, and uh, to Noor Pangu, who's the curator of the show that, um, that uh, I have on at the um, Dunlop Gallery. Um, I also want to... Uh, mentioned that I'm talking from Toronto, uh, which is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, and Mississaugas of the Credit River. And uh, I'm an immigrant settler myself. In fact, today's uh, quite a um, uh, wonderful day in a way to have this talk. Uh, it's 45 years ago today that I arrived um, in Canada as a two and a half year old immigrant. Um, so, you know, that's a long time ago, and I think over the years I've been thinking, especially more recently, about, um, uh, you know, who, who and how displacement occurred when sort of um, waves and waves of immigrants uh, such as myself came from South Asia to this land, and um, what kind of development ensued, and, and who that development um, benefits and who it doesn't. So something I'm thinking about uh, today, and I think... Um, we might get into some of that in, in our conversation. Um, I also want to just say congratulations to Nor Black Nor White. I think, um, I, I, I don't know if you remember, Mariga, but I came down to your studio when you guys had just moved to Bombay. I was like a lot younger. You guys were just starting out. And I remember seeing 
your Facebook, I think at the time, and then, and then the, uh, your first website, which was this amazing website. It's still one of my favorite websites of the train, this sort of graphic of this Indian railway train cart by cart, kind of moving through the different um, regions of India and then these sort of pop imagery and, and um, your clothes in the middle of the compartment. So that was really cool. And uh, yeah, that was a long time ago. So it's nice to, nice to talk now. Thank and you. Uh, congratulations you. for just making it through the pandemic as well. Um, so we're going to have a conversation back and forth. And um, yeah, let's just, uh, I'm going to just jump right in. So, um, uh, so Marika, we, we see recently that many artists and designers are turning towards craft makers and artisans to either work collaboratively or see their creative visions come to life. I actually see Nor Black Nor White as having started this interest among young urban diasporic um, Desis, uh, South Asians, uh, this interest in handcraft and its revival um, among this population. And I think you guys sort of started this trend, uh, made it possible for others to imagine themselves working in this way, for others to sort of um, uh, understand their contemporary relationship with craft. You describe on your website the significance of that first unexpected visit for you guys to the Bandhani workshop in Kutch and meeting the Katris, a multi-generational family uh, business making Bandhani fabric, which I guess was the fabric for your first collection. Um, is this revival of undervalued craft traditions and makers an explicit aim of your label? Um, do you see yourselves as revivalists or as a source of pop popular education about Indian craft and textile? <laughs> thanks, Mir. Thanks, Mir. First of all, hello everyone, and thanks for spending some time with us this evening. Um, and I want to thank other people in the gallery and the entire team. And I am speaking to you from Tongva land, so that's known um, as Los Angeles. And I don't know if there's an echo. Is there an echo? No? Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so I, I really appreciate having this conversation, especially actually during this specific time uh, in our journey and particularly just in my personal life to reflect on all of the work. Like you just said, Mira, you're having a reflection day on a big theme of your work, which is immigration and, and settling and um, the benefits of that. So it's interesting, the timing of this conversation. Um, and yeah, for, for everyone, just thanking you for even just caring to take some time to understand process. So in regards to uh, your question, Mira, it's a big question. And um, it's funny that you brought up that train website because I haven't thought about that in a really long time. And I, really connected with the obviously initial creation of No Black No White. That's it came out of, you know, a burst of energy. And and everything that we created at that point felt very aligned in terms of expression of exactly what we were feeling at that moment. And I do feel like that train website was an amazing way to, you know, introduce this crazy journey that we've been on so far. And when you say that, you know, you feel that we are one of the people and um, groups of people that started this wave, I take that with a great responsibility. Um, it wasn't the in intention at all to start a big wave. It was truly just a personal project and, um, and like an art project for us. And we didn't even expect or uh, intend for it to become, um, you know, an organized situation or leading to like a business. Like it was literally us, me and, and my very dear friend, who's also originally from um, Toronto, she's South Asian, she's Punjabi, her name is Amrit Kumar. So it was the two of us just on um, an exploration journey. And it really started from that. And it still is that to some extent, obviously, you know, it's been so many years and there's so many more people involved, but the essence of it was to be able to expose people around the world, that being diaspora and just generally people to Indian craftsmanship and Indian textile in um, a point of, from a point of view that 
that was just literally our point of view, you know, like we weren't trying to create it for anyone, but just telling what, telling people what we're seeing. And we were truly fascinated. We were, we couldn't understand how so many people in, uh, in India and specifically the Khatris who we, we were introduced to Bandhani through the process of Bandhani, which is Bandhani, which means to tie and die. Um, and they're made up of these small little um, ties. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with them, but I'm sure you've seen different versions of them, but essentially it is tie and die. And, and the essence of that process, which is a very classical textile in India, if you've grown up in India or watched any sort of movie or seen any Indian textile, you've probably come across it. So it is a very common thing to see, but when we learned and witnessed the process of it, it was mind blowing. Uh, the amount of time, first of all, that it took to create the textile and the people around the creation of the textile and how they all work as a family and then also work as a village because different people work on different parts of the same process. And it was fascinating. And truly that was what it all started from. It came from that place of expressing just the story behind it, the people behind it, and the process behind it. And for us to show our appreciation to that process. And then the fun came when we got to take that textile and then make it our own and bring it to life in our own way, which was, you know, creating the garments from that and creating the silhouettes from that. So I just wanted to say that, you know, we didn't start this to create a wave. Um, it came from a personal journey and expression, and it's wild to see the ecosystem that is bubbling right now and the care um, that I think people are starting to wake up and appreciate and want to take time and value the process of craftsmanship and um, just artistry out of not only India, but around the world and just process in general, you know, valuing people's process and questioning it too and 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 um, taking time to admire it and also learn about what exactly you are putting on your body and also um, I don't want to say the word consuming but like I guess contributing to with your money like what are you what are you spending your energy on right so it is it's been a wild journey we've been around for now 13 years and I definitely can say that in the beginning of this journey, it was truly a lot of excitement and um, that kept us going. But there was a, many, many no's along the way and a lot of questioning and not understanding, is this a nonprofit organization? Are you a social venture? Are you artists? Are you a business? Like, what is this? And it was very hard to define that. And it to this day still is because it feels like a baby, but it is um, overall a space for people to learn from. And it, it kind of has many, many arms and touches all the things. And yeah, so to, to witness where we're at right now in the ecosystem of things, it is interesting. And I just, um, I hope that people are doing it with care and true integrity and, um, and, you know, not just considering it a fad or a trend or a phase because we've seen that come and go a lot. And that's all like I just wish that that is taken quite seriously. But it is um, it is truly a blessing Like we were we were excited to see, you know, in the last many years, people actually caring. And and I wouldn't really say necessarily we're revivalists at at by any nature i i feel like there's a lot of responsibility and there's so many people doing work on the ground in india and researchers even around the world but also just people that we've personally met running organizations that are really dedicated to working on the ground every single day with all types of communities and artists and um and it's just work on the background you know people don't get to meet them or see them and and they are, I think, the true people and practitioners of reviving and making sure and maintaining 
the art forms and we're just coming in there too and doing whatever we can to share it with the world and promote it with the world within our communities and also um, have a different visual language around it. So more people or different types of people are exposed to that, you know? So yeah, it's a, it's a loaded question for me, that word revival, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful statement to be a revivalist, but I, I don't feel like that we kind of fall in that. Um, I just feel like we're just a little speck in that, you know, massive ecosystem of work that's happening. And, um, and for that, I'm, I am grateful. Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, hearing you sort of say that it wasn't um, an intentional um, beginning for your journey to, to sort of educate, um, in a sense, like casually educate people about uh, people in the diaspora about craft tradition, uh, craft techniques in India. Um, it sort of just happened because you loved what you were seeing and you were learning in the process. Um, I think that there's, you know, so I, you know, I understand that you're not revivalist as such, but I think that inspiration that you guys felt um, is sort of somehow through your clothing and also through not just the clothing, but also the media campaigns, the marketing, the imagery, um, it really sparked that um, investigation or that inspiration among a lot of diasporic South Asians that, hey, this is, you know, this is something, this is not just something that we grew up with in our homes, the Bandani, for example, you know, it's not just something on our, our, our aunties like Chunni, you know, it's something that we can connect with. And I think you kind of picked up on that zeitgeist of we were all sort of um, doing that to some extent with how we would dress anyways in the diaspora, right? We might like put on, um, put, borrow, borrow our mom's jewelry and, and sort of mix that up with like whatever we were wearing to like you know, to a party or something like that. And so you kind of, you guys kind of, I think, took that and, and took it a step forward. Um, and I think, uh, you know, coming back to the early part of what you were saying around, you didn't intend to do this, but as you got deeper into it, you just saw how wide and broad this ecosystem of craft, of making, of um, is in, in India, as you started to sort of go deeper into this, reminds me, makes me, think about, um, in a sense, it's it's parallel to what I've been doing more recently with my art, which is thinking about how, um, you know, pattern is not just pattern, the, the South Asian, the Indian patterns that I've painted in the past on, you know, um, in, in some of the artwork that I've created comes from a history. And in fact, the more I look into it, the more I realize I hardly know any of this. And lots of people hardly know anything about this. The, the depth of the textile trade and the textile um, craft in India and South Asia just goes back thousands of years and, and, it's, and it sort of permeates, I think, into every nook and cranny of that, that landscape, you know? So I think what, you're, what you um, found yourself in as you stepped into um, Bombay, uh, you know, when you first got there is something similar to what I'm doing now, but I'm, I'm looking at it more historically, more in terms of um, its relationship to uh, colonialism and capitalism and thinking about um, thinking about cloth in that way as well. Yeah, I wanted to understand your um, journey and relationship to expressing um, your your understanding through your process as an artist to India itself and the culture. Um, and then where did you feel the formative moments happen when you felt responsible to express that that relationship to India and through your, your point of view through your art? Yeah, um, I think when I initially started, similar to you, I didn't really feel a sense of responsibility to anyone. Uh, I was just curious. I was trying to make sense of my, uh, you know, differing identities, and bring them together. And, and that was the basis of my exploration of sort of South Asian um, uh, art and craft and pattern and, um, you know, and color. And but now I think as I've moved through it over the last 10 or 15 years, I do actually feel a sense of responsibility that I think comes with being um, 
being a diasporic South Asian or diasporic Indian artist uh, or a Canadian Indian artist, whatever you want to call it, there is a responsibility to, I think, um, be really, um, uh, be able to speak about what you do and be able to, um, be able to, you know, have a consciousness around it and consciousness around where this material comes from, where, what the imagery suggests, what it means. And um, so I think, you know, um, there's also being uh, an artist in Canada, I think there's also a bit of a, um, a vacuum in which my practice exists. You know, you guys are located in India where there isn't, um, when you're in India, I'm guessing you don't need to educate people so much about what you're doing and where this stuff comes from and who you're working with. Whereas over here, I think there is a bit of a vacuum when it comes to uh, contemporary South Asian cultural production. There isn't a lot of sort of critical public dialogue, um, artistic dialogue about it, or, or, you know, that education or that sort of dialogue is kind of lacking. So I think part of my responsibility also is to make sure that the nuances are understood and it's not just, you know, it's not just about the imagery that, that I'm producing. And in terms of, and just to add to that, in terms of formative moments, I remember um, as a university student going to a small little private gallery in um, Yorkville where Surinder Dhalival had uh, had a show as, um, as a, she was, it was a commercial gallery and this was sort of around the first time I was seeing her work um, in person. I had studied her work for my master's um, subsequent to that. But I saw, I walked into this small little commercial space and I saw a room full of like rich Punjabi color and imagery and objects and paintings and sculpture. And, you know, and I just, it, it, it was a real big formative moment for me because I felt for the first time ever seen and reflected in what I was looking at, I felt like she opened that show, just opened the doors for me to, to, to think about, hey, you know, I can address my own identity, my own history, you know, my own experiences in life through my artwork, because here is someone else who's doing it. And, um, uh, and actually, you know, just a little plug, Surinder is having a, a solo show of her work at the Art Gallery of Ontario uh, later this summer. And I think in terms of this leg, this vacuum that I'm talking about, you know, I feel like that show, that show could have happened a long time ago, you know, and, but I, I think that the process is a lot slower being where I am versus maybe, you know, for you guys being where you guys are. Yeah, and yeah. I would like to address that. Many, many people in India itself don't know anything about textiles or what they're wearing or you know because it's just around them so when things are around you sometimes we you know we take things for granted so even in that context let's so like they may be familiar with like a surface level idea of this okay being a bandhani or this being a kanji or i'm sorry or whatever it is but they maybe don't understand the process behind all of that stuff that's happening just around them. And so we do have to educate people also through anywhere we are. It's I think it's just the wanting to value the art artistry behind it all. And um, that even comes from like the tailor and like this is our master tailor, Muhammad G. And he, he's been with us from day zero. So he used to work with um, someone else in Bombay and he wanted a part-time gig. So we got connected with him through a friend and he would start, you know, he'd visit us three times a week with his backpack. We would give him our little sketches and some fabric that we made the bandhani and he would take it away and, you know, we, we'd come back and forth and that's how we built our first collection. And him as a master too, like his, his artistry, like he didn't get trained anywhere. He just watched and he learned. And so the, we, we laugh. And I, I think I was talking about this with you um, earlier, Mira. So we call him like the Andaz style, right? So he's never looking at things technically. He just has a rough idea and is cutting patterns through the, and like, I don't know if you've seen 
patterns being cut, but it's such a beautiful process too. Like it's just large shapes being cut. And even from that, like that starting point of the process of a garment, it's really beautiful. And every single piece is legitimately, you know, it's being cut there and someone's eye is looking at that. So from the fabric to the, to the actual garment and there's so many more um, tailors, I guess, and access to tailors in India. So yes, people are more familiar with the tailoring process, but when it comes to the fabrication process and the actual textiles of India, I think um, I think people on a mass scale aren't very familiar, and they're starting slowly to, you know, get wind of that um, because. From a global scale and a popular culture scale, people are starting to talk about it. So um, it's just, you know, it's starting to happen. So it's even a vacuum sometimes within the country itself, right? Like if we're all having different relationships to how we work and obviously the diaspora works in isolation in a very different way and has a certain perspective, but also within India, there's so many levels to it and and yeah, so I just kind of wanted to address that. Um, and I was wondering, you were talking about, you know, seeing the gateway of Punjab kind of open and all the colors and and that kind of widening of your, your lens. And what were your trips to Punjab like growing up? Like, what was your relationship to visiting India and specifically visiting Punjab? And, and how did... Um, the nuances of that culture kind of evolve slowly through your artwork? Um, for me, uh, I was born in New Delhi and um, I have traveled sort of uh, through, throughout large parts of the country, including Punjab, but mostly Delhi is home and has been home for every, every visit that I've made to that country, um, which you know, one or two or three years, uh, from childhood up until present. And, um, and so it's always been, it's also been um, personally a place of, in a sense, a place of refuge, a place of excitement, a place of um, lots of, uh, lots to sort of see and learn. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, uh, my dad used to sing, my dad used to sing this song to me when I was a kid. And I think this, you know, I really took the song to heart and it was, um, uh, Mukesh song from Sri Charsobis, uh, excuse my accent, but um, it goes something like, uh, I don't know if you know the song, Riga, Mera Juta Hai Japani, Ye Patloon English, English Tani, Sarpe Lal Topi Rusi, Fir Bi Dil Hai Hindustani. So, um, uh, the, my shoes are Japanese, um, my pants are English, on my head is a red Russian hat, but still my heart is Hindustani or Indian. Um, and I think that kind of uh, sentiment really sort of has come through, come through my, through my work over the years. And, you know, and I think I try over and over again through different um, mediums, through different imagery, through different conversations to bring these two realities of my life together, partly as a, as a healing for myself, as a stitching together of myself um, that, you know, was, uh, as many of us have been altered through the migration process, um, but, um, you know, also partly just out of interest and now more recently, uh, more out of sort of through research as well. Um, and, you know, I think um, talking to you about uh, hearing you say that, you know, even where you guys are located, there is not um, a vast understanding of textile history, let's say, or textile making, let's say. I want to just jump into another question I have um, that I think bounces off of that, um, which is uh, my friend and my colleague, uh, friend and colleague, Namitha Gupta Wiggers, uh, said in a talk that she, quote, learned art history but lived craft. And I found this to be a powerful and succinct expression of what many South Asians in the diaspora grew up with in our homes. Uh, art in the sense of sculpture and painting may not have graced our walls and floors, but surely many textile-based crafts such as uh, block-printed bedspreads, um, embroidered cushion covers, machine-woven religious tapestries, hand-woven rugs, 
um, were, were in our homes. And, and yet, in high school and university, I only learned about our art history. I didn't learn about craft history. As an artist now, I see craft as such an intrinsic part of what I work with. And, you know, I'm wondering if, yeah, I mean, you suggested that that is similar for you guys and that you grew up with all of this, but, you know, um, because it's everywhere, it's almost invisible. And I'm wondering, you know, if you guys see yourselves as designers or artists, as craftspeople, as culture makers, as entrepreneurs, um, or a combination of these, or if you feel that these terms are insufficient or outdated, um, or, you know, or have they shifted, have, you know, maybe one year you're more of an artist and the next year you're more of a business person, the next year you're more of a hands-on craft maker. Like, you know, how do you see yourself fitting into um, these categories that for me were, you know, were, were living, like were things that I lived with um, in a sense, but I didn't know much about. Um... It's a very tricky question because it's hard to identify uh, with one title. And I do think we swing between all of the all of the terms that you just mentioned right now. And tr like the name nor black nor white comes from exploring a gray space. We aren't both Amrit and I um, aren't trained textile artists. We're not trained designers. Um, like, and I mean trained as in, you know, we didn't go to formal art school. Everything that we have created has been from an intuitive place and there have been no rules attached to it. And, you know, we, including all the imagery, like we direct all the imagery, we, we style it, we cast it, like it is, coming from our vision and it all come came and comes intuitively so um it's a very you know many hats situation so at some points like you said you know we have to turn up the artist inside of us at other points we have to you know understand how it works within the context of the system of the world and promoting things so like the business aspect of it then you know we have to put our designer hats on and because we're not technically trained we're learning on the go like we are learning things as we are doing them and the, the things that we cannot do the things that we can do you know like it's all happening as we're doing it which has been quite um, rewarding, but obviously super challenging because it takes much longer. Um, so we've been very kind of slow and steady and and generous with ourselves for making so many <laughs> mistakes along the way. And um, I think the benefit for us of not going to an art school is truly there are no rules for us. So whatever we imagine, we try to make that happen as is. And we work really well as a team because we're like a no fuss, like low, like we can make magic happen with very little, you know, we, that's the kind of entrepreneurial spirit, I guess, that come, that lies in, in the both of us. And um, we can just kind of make it happen. And there's an art in that as well. So uh, especially in, in India, one term, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar, Mira, like Jugaad, right? You have to... You kind of have to like Jugad is like, mm, how do you describe Jugad? Like, uh, make it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Like, you kind of just have to rough around the edges, but not really like figure it out. You know, it's a little bit of making things happen, and that that energy really carries how how we have created the space um, and created like our world within it. So uh, I definitely think it is overall in the world of culture makers and just shores of a little piece of what we respect um, and are kind of trying to storytell through our vision in, in, you know, creating culture. And so the designations definitely are fluid and they change. And I think truly the name nor black nor white, it describes exactly where we're at with that process. You know, there is um, multiple identities being discussed. There's multiple textile forms, multiple art forms. We have like a strong community that we work with. And 
Um, and that's kind of been the negotiation for us is like, where do we fall into all of that? And, and finally growing up and being accepting of, you know, you don't have to pick one. And that comes with like being immigrants, being diaspora, all of the things, you know, and settlers, like all of it. And also for us, like going back to India, not only are we coming, you know, we're here, but now we're also othered there. Like we have shifted back to India and that whole process was like the whole thing too, right? So finding that um, comfort in and security and like being cool with where we're at in that process. And, you know, we're very, very blessed and lucky to attract amazing community and people around us. So the support has been a real like village that's like supported us along the way. And um, yeah, that, that living in that has been, has been really beautiful. So yeah, when you talk about roles and, and names and, and, um, and designations, I think that's kind of where I stand. And, and in regards to the living craft element that you were discussing, I think that's a really beautiful way of looking at it. Um, and it surfaces on the question of like, what are the stark differences between like art and craft, right? Like what what is that language and why is something a craft versus something an art? Like in in artistry, you have to have your craft, like you're crafting something no matter what it is. So where did that that separation happen? And and for us, like I was I was um I grew up in a household with a lot of respect for the arts, art forms, um, all types of art forms, and including like music and dance. My my mother is a Bharat Natyam dancer. My father actually loved to sing Mukesh songs, <laughs> including the one Mera Juta Hai Japani. And and like I grew up with a lot of performing arts um, around me, and through that too, like my my mother was also. Um, a big fan of, you know, wearing saris, like she grew up wearing saris, that's actually, you know, I think personally, like what she looks the most beautiful in and the most comfortable in, and, and it's not even like in a formal attire, like just a plain cotton regular sari, like doing her thing, you know, and so I grew up amongst that around me, um, and and I think that that just, that does seep into you in some, at some level, when you're growing up with that, you feel comfortable with that. And I was really lucky. I was actually born in India, but, um, and then when we migrated, I would be visiting my grandparents for three months every year for basically every year. So I did have exposure since I was um, a child. And and that just means like being exposed to, to, to like literally living in India and being exposed to all the crafts around. So I, I don't, I can't say like a moment in which I was exposed to like being living in, in the crafts world, but um, it definitely was just a way of life, you know? And and like, what, how does, what does that look like for you? How did you, uh, did you grow up kind of living in, in craft as well or? Um, and well, I'm curious to know what your relationship was to Indian textile or and like when that got introduced or even just Indian wear, like how did that kind of come into your life? Because a lot of your work, um, well, some of your work, I would say, really deeply explores like fashion and and pairing together your um, relationship to Canada and obviously India and Punjab and kind of blending those two. And, and I remember um, when we did one of our very first pop-ups, we also had, um, we were selling, you know, we sell different people that we respect work and you had upping the auntie, the coloring book, right? At, at that pop-up. And we loved those, that auntie, upping the auntie series that you did um, initially. And so, yeah, what was your relationship to, to Indian textile, Indian wear, and, and when did you get kind of the idea for that? Yeah, um, thanks for asking that question because um, I have a lot to say about that. I think part of it is a journey backwards in discovering all the different ways that clothing and textile were a part of my life growing up. Um, so that, you know, understanding that the interests that I have now and the questions that I ask now in my work, they didn't just come out of the blue, like they came out of a history and a past. and that was um, growing up quite rooted in my family as well. So 
you know, when my family first migrated here, my mother um, took up a job at the Singer sewing machine with, with Singer sewing machines and was sort of selling sewing machines. Um, and so she would also sew my own clothes uh, or sew some of my own clothes. Um, I remember going to Fabricland with her as a child and like, you know, looking at notions and things like this and fabrics. Um, my father was like loved clothes, you know, just loved them and loved sort of um, uh, dressing up, not, not necessarily formally, but just like loved, you know, accessories and clothes. And, and so I grew up in that environment, but I also grew up in the environment where one side of my family were sort of business people. The other side of my family were writers and um, teachers, um, graphic designers. And so I had, you know, a lot of that as well. But like you, the arts, I mean, I think, uh, you know, as, as, as someone who had the privilege to be able to go back to, to India, you know, for summers, to spend summers with my grandparents, um, I just remember bringing back um, with my family, with my parents, you know, on my own, bringing back um, cloth, whether it was like gifts, like, you know, often gifts over there are cloth. They're, you know, you'll you'll get a shawl or you'll get a um, cushion cover or you'll get, you know, um, uh, things like that. But I also grew up with like an environment where the arts were, were quite valued in, in our home. And so I think now that I look back, in fact, actually one of the side um, hustles my parents had when they were trying to, get, trying to just sort of get by as new immigrants was to bring um, table mats like a, uh, um, block printed, cotton block printed table mats and matching napkins and um, bedspreads and sell these things at like local fairs and things just to, you know, to make a bit of um, extra money. And, and so it was just part of my life, part of my life growing up. And now when I look back, I'm not just at that, but when I look back sort of um, through the research I'm doing in um, thinking about cotton and its long, long history in sort of trade between um, the Indian Ocean and other parts of the world, its relationship to, you know, every large historical, um, devastating historical um, experience that the world has gone through, um, uh, you know, whether that's industrialization or um, capitalism, colonialism, the slave trade, um, uh, the sort of um, the uh, um, displacement of indigenous peoples in North America, all of it all of it is connected to textiles and cotton and all of it has a history in India um, or in that part of the world in South Asia. Um, and so I think it's just, for me, it's sort of all around. And, and on a personal level, I've always, also always loved clothes. I think the way I understood myself growing up in high school, I was kind of, you know, an outsider throughout my entire high school. Um, I was in a very white high school. Um, and I found myself through clothes and through music and, you know, and because I kind of related to cloth so much in that way, it was, um, it, it's something that I feel, I feel like the weight of clothing, like I feel the stories that they share with us or that we share with them. And, you know, I think clothing is in our commercial world is sort of made to exist in this like vacuum where we're not supposed to know how it's made, where it's come from, how has it been, you know, colored, how has it been cut? Um, we're not supposed to know that we're just supposed to buy and throw. And so I think if you start to slow that process down and you start to look at it and you start to see how much um, influence it has in people's lives and how much meaning it has in people's lives, it kind of just like, you know, blows your mind. Um, and so I think like cloth and clothing um, and craft has been has been with me all the time. And actually, I, I mentioned Namitha um, Gupta Wiggers earlier, she coined this term um, craftscape. And I think craftscape is such a perfect little term to think about um, the craft object, the object that we consider craft. Um, so, you know, textile falls in that. Um, it exists within a landscape. It exists within like an entire ecosystem. It's not just this object that you purchase and you use and that's all. 
Um, so I want to. Um, I want to actually. Think we, I think we gotta wrap it up. Okay, I got a quick, quick question. Okay. I want to know from you guys, from you guys, if there's a particular garment that you guys always love to come back to to design, like. You know, is there a particular, is it like the shirt or is it like a, a bomber jacket or is it, you know, a pair of pants or like what is, is there, is there a particular thing that like you're always going to work with or you, you just love to come back to? Like, quick question. I think, um, I think um, we can pick one. I think we are really good at a frock, like different types of frocks, different types of dresses um, uh, because we love the feminine kind of energy with that. And and we can do a lot with textile because it's all, and we love the more fabric, the better. It doesn't really work out usually from a costing perspective for us, which is a nightmare, but, um, but there's a lot you can do with pleating and draping and just the way things fall on different types of bodies. And um, all genders like love to wear a dress. And so it's it's been a really fun thing to play with. And I think it's a very strong, part of our um of our design and um and we love to like this the idea of like you know a frock like we grew up wearing frocks like all the time and and it feels like we've come back to that you know and and that feels good so obviously we love a bomber and a, and a sweat set and a match we love matching things like all of the things but i think um i think one of the core things that we are um great at is like a, a classic like dress element of some sort yeah. yeah um i feel like we need to wrap up because it's looking like our time but uh should we get into q a perhaps yes <laughs> um uh, so I wanted to first off before we jump into Q and A, just thank you guys for um, a very generative and rich discussion. I think what really resonated with me as I heard you both talking was um, the importance of the environments that you both grew up in, um, and how in different ways that that's influenced and and shaped the way that you guys are working. So. You know, it, just thinking about how young Riga or young Mira in these different environments, you know, surrounded by your family members, surrounded by their interests and their influences, and how, you know, years later, years down the line, that in some way, in some capacity, um, those influences have are, are ref being reflected in what you're doing today. Um, so thank you for, for sharing uh, your perspectives with us. Um, and so I do wanna see if there are any questions um, from the audience members who are watching at home. Um, feel free to drop your questions in the chat or even if you just have some comments, maybe uh, our tech person, Eric, behind the scenes, if he wants to share some questions or, okay. All right, we do have a question. This is from Industani V. Hi, Industani. Um, so the question is for Mira. In recent years, you've been making work exploring the history and social aspects of textiles in so many different mediums. Can you tell us about what medium for you expresses this exploration the best? Anyways, it's 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 painting, um, painting or drawing. Um, when I'm specifically painting or drawing textile patterns, and I'm often um, either I'm either making them up or I'm copying them. And I think the reason that expresses it best is because it forces me through looking to slow down my appreciation of what I'm looking at because painting and drawing both take a lot of time, um, or at least in the way that I do them. So you know, it's like a forced method of looking deeply because weaving, for example, like takes so long and making a painting of a weaving also takes a long time. And, you know, I think that that parallel um, expresses uh, that relationship quite well for me. Cool, thank you. So um, 
just a follow-up question to that, Mira. Uh, do you have any new work coming soon that we can that we can t check out or take in? Uh, yes, yeah, so I've got two uh, solo shows happening, opening in Cambridge in September uh, 2023, so later in the year. And one of them takes off where uh, the show at the Dunlop um, sort of leaves, which is uh, I've got three coats at the Dunlop and at the show at Cambridge, it's going to be all of them together. There's 12 of them. And um, and then the other gallery is, uh, uh, is more um, sort of uh, painting and drawing that looks at the history of textile production um, from all the way from South Asia to uh, North America. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank, Excellent. You. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, a comment from Wendy. Hi, Wendy. Wendy says, I like how you both touched on notions of labor and how craft artistic impulse, artistic impulse and labor are so intertwined. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that the, the conversation you guys were having around colonialism and capitalism um, and how your work uh, interplays within those worlds is, is really meaningful here. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for that comment. Um, Okay, and um, if there are no other comments or questions, um, or Marika, do you have any uh, final thoughts that you wanted to share with us? Um, <laughs> you're good? Uh, I think I'm good. I think I talked enough. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Okay. All right, we're gonna wrap up. <laughs> Um, and so I just want to thank you guys again. Uh, thank you for being our guests. Um, Riga and Mira, um, you know, I, I really appreciate you both taking the time to, to have this generative conversation with each other and with all of us as well. Again, Mira's exhibition is on now. Tomorrow is the last day at Dunlop Art Gallery's Sherwood Village location. I encourage you all to check it out. It was guest curated by Noor Bangu. And thank you again, Riga. Um, yeah, I hope to meet you in person sometime. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Bye.